Um, and uh, thank you to the organizers for having me here. It's a great honor to be speaking in front of you know this great audience. So, um, well, <clears throat> the topic of my talk is slightly uh, different to what uh, is written in the uh, uh, schedule. So, um, I would like to talk today with you about the main problem of humanity, which is <coughs> why hasn't transhumanism won? And it's actually the dark matter. It's something that we cannot explain and we don't understand. Um, okay. um, so, when, well, transhumanism is, is really many things. And uh, when Alex Lightman was giving his presentation, I was thinking to myself, okay, good luck following that. Um, so I'd like to pay your attention to one very important thing. Transhumanism is enhancing the capabilities, extending the capabilities of a human being using the technology. And it offers us a really strict hierarchy of goals. It basically dictates what's the most important thing that we need to focus our, our attention on, and it's preserving our life. Because really, it doesn't matter what we like in life, whether it's our family, our kids, it's, it, it may be love, it may be sex, money, power, creativity, business, whatever, you name it. Um, but in order to actually um, benefit from all those things, we have to be alive in the first place. And life is our main, um, it's our uh, main right, it's our main demand and desire. And um, transhumanism uh, seeks to preserve life. That's uh, goal number one. So, <clears throat> um, there are many ways how we can extend our, our lifespans. Um, there, there is studying the fundamental mechanisms of aging and uh, creating the uh, ways how we can extend lifespan. There is cyborgization, um, there's regenerative medicine, there's um, neuromodeling, and if that's successful, uh, there comes the same substrate into present minds. There's also cryonics. But I'd like to focus on the biological ways of how we can uh, live longer and uh, healthier. Not a lot of people, and I mean um, among the general public, know that there are significant results that have been achieved. I mean, I think these people, they're like saints. <laughs> they're um, best people on earth because they are the record, uh, the breakers for life extension. So Robert Schmuckler Rees uh, from the University of Arkansas was able to extend lifespan of a nematode um, by creating a mutation in the H1 gene. And it's the homolog of um, PI3K kind of is what that we all have. Um, Walter Longo extended lifespan of yeast also quite significantly. And um, speaking of mammals, um, well, so certain manipulations can be done to a mouse. And Antje Barker showed that, um, well, his lab animal um, lived twice, um, twice as long as the regular mice do. And that was done by uh, mutation in the uh, growth hormone receptor gene and um, caloric restriction. So there are results, and we, we really can extend lifespan. But those results were achieved in uh, transgene animals. And there um, are different groups of genes that we can um, either switch on or switch off to the extent that we want in order to live longer and healthier. However, um, we cannot really create transgene ourselves, right? This approach kind of doesn't work for humans. But <clears throat> this is where gene therapy comes in handy. Um, I think this is one of the greatest achievements. Maria Blasco from Spain um, was able to increase lifespan of really old mice, two-year-old mice, uh, pre-old mice by 13%. 
And the younger mice were even black hair, they only 24% um, longer. That was done by uh, whole body transfection with telomerase. Uh, this is the enzyme that lengthens our telomeres that, you know, to be shortening um, throughout lifespan. So <clears throat> if we create viral vectors and insert longevity-associated genes inside of them, and the genes that I had in the previous slide, well, for example, there's actually more than 100 uh, genes that are known to be implicated in longevity mechanism. So we can perhaps create um, effective and safe means of extending even human lifespans. Of course, all of this needs to be tested in animals first, but this is a possibility. Another approach is um, decreasing the activity of uh, mobile genetic elements. These are like intrinsic viruses that um, start to jump more often as we age from one place into another in our genome, and they add up to genetic instability, and this leads to really detrimental things to our health. So um, this is just one of the ideas. I think this slide is very important because we need to create the diagnostics platform of aging. We need to create, okay, suppose we have those, um, I don't know, pills that extend lifespan. Okay, how are we gonna know if they're effective or not? We need to create a measurement system that would tell us exactly what is happening within a human body. Uh, because if we just start giving those pills to a experimental group, if the pills are effective, it's actually bad news for us because we won't be alive to see the end of the experiment. <laughs> so this is why we need to um, analyze our genome, epigenome, metabolome, transcriptome, and um, analysis of this big data will yield um, really understanding of what's happening in our bodies, what are our, our baselines, what are those numbers that literally indicate the youthful state of our own organism. And then we need to fight for those youthful uh, numbers. And um, I guess many of you may know Michael Snyder, who is the head of genetics department here at Stanford University, and he's um, published this paper, which is exactly the proof of principle that this can be done. The only um, thing is that he wasn't really focusing on aging, but type 2 diabetes is a completely age-related disease. So um, it's just, we need to take this one step. And also, one important thing that um, if aging is recognized as a disease, this can be a very effective um, way to create a metric for um, eventually um, curing this disease. Another way to extend lifespan is for pharmacological intervention. And um, there was this great paper published by a group of um, researchers and Richard Miller, um, Dr. Harrison, um, with their collaborators, showed in three different independent labs that rapamycin does extend uh, lifespan of all mice. And rapamycin is the star drug. I mean, a lot of attention is paid to it. Uh, for example, um, um, Dr. Brian Kennedy from the Buck Institute, which is located in Nevada, not far from here, they want to tweak the rapamycin molecule because uh, actually it's kind of, it can be bad, really. Um, it has side effects. So the idea is um, <coughs> to tweak it in a way that it affects not both of the subunits of the TOR protein, but only one of them which um, is responsible for longevity. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other drugs that need to be tested. Another interesting approach is, um, okay, so um, evolutionary biology is very interesting because it may yield um, results if we study uh, the long-lived animals and their close relatives, we can identify those mechanisms that actually make it possible for those guys 
um, like look at those rockfish. I mean, oh my God, 200 years as opposed to 10 years, which is the short-lived rockfish from the same family. So let's compare those animals and figure out what are those genes that are responsible for the successional longevity mechanism, and then we could create transgen transgenic animals with those genes, and then we perhaps could create viral vectors or figure out the pharmacological intervention that could either um, boost the activity of those genes or suppress it. <coughs> so, okay, the main idea is we really, really know what to do, and I listed only several of those directions that could be beneficial. Um, <clears throat> again, um, we know what to do, but we need the money. Research is expensive, and for example, Buck Institute, um, which is one of the leaders in the world in aging research, do you know how large its annual budget is? It's $37 million, but it should be $37 billion. So the question is, where can we get the rest? And this brings us to the dark matter of transhumanism. There's um, a list, it's actually a little bit longer than this one, of different reasons why transhumanism has not won yet. Why uh, the life extension ideas are not dominant around the world. And um, the reasons are quite serious. Uh, people are conservative. People um, live in a very strict, that they follow stereotypes. They believe in afterlife and God, God knows what. Um, and this belief in afterlife prevents the people to fight for their physical life here on Earth. And this is why if they do not choose, um, they do not choose their life. They, they don't do anything. Science is complicated, and I think the majority of people wouldn't be even able to distinguish DNA, gene, and protein. Like, just go outside and out of Stanford or maybe Silicon Valley and ask anybody, <laughs> I'm sure um, people would make mistakes answering this question. So the complexity is not helping. Um, and um, the politicians are um, <coughs> focused on what is what public wants um, right now at this moment. But actually, um, even worse, they're declaring that they're interested in what public wants right now. And um, it unfortunately um, happens often that they don't do anything good, like literally. And taboo of talking about death, okay, if I just tell you right now that um, if nothing changes, every single one of you guys will rot in horrible pain, devastating, um, like you're gonna start hating me right away and you would want me to, to shut up and move on with my presentation because the thoughts about death are the um, most unpleasant ones and we do not want to um, you know, step out of our psychological comfort zone. We would um, do anything, create any um, you know, bullshit arguments just in order to get ourselves inside our comfort zone. Um, and of course, transhumanism, unfortunately, is not well known around the world. There are not enough articles, there are not enough movies, there are not enough public, there's not enough public awareness. And there, is, um, there are other things, like for example, um, the worldwide pandemic of idiocy, and um, I don't know, this, this list can go on, <laughs> literally. Um, however, so, even though those reasons are very serious, each and single one of them, we still don't understand why, why uh, transhumanism hasn't won, because this all is not enough. The progress is moving on um, very fast. It's exponential growth, and everybody is using the technology, like a lot of people have cell phones. Remember, I don't know, 1996? Only the richest of the rich people would have these huge phones and they would be like very proud of, um, of themselves for owning those pieces of technology. And now look at like, the majority, I think, of the, uh, well, at least Western world, everybody has a cell phone. Um, 
So, so what can we do to find the funding for life extension research? Because actually this is the most important question for us, and I really literally mean us. Um, there are several ways, several scenarios. Um, we can, well, a social mandate can be formed. If such a mandate among the general public is formed, then um, life extension technologies could be created very, very fast because, um, first of all, it would help significantly to bring the existing um, medical and scientific advances into the clinic. Because if the politicians are um, working on life extension, I mean, a lot of, th th that, that would be really, um, that would yield fast and efficient results because a lot of government agencies are closely related with longevity. For example, um, security, for example, the efficiency of road police, reducing accidents, medical care, and if we take the, the, the quality of education, this is also, the, the, all those things are related to life extension. Um, but there also are limitations to that. Um, in order to create a social mandate, we would need to persuade a lot of people, and I mean like crazy amounts of people. And we cannot do that without an access to influential mass media, which we don't. And I mean, by we, I mean transhumanists. Transhumanists. Um, also, the problem is really hard to understand unfortunately, because people are confined in their uh, stereotypes that they follow in their everyday life. Um, and again, the problem with politicians, because um, really, if a politician declares that, okay, I'm gonna work on life extension from now on, what does it really mean? It means that before that, um, he wasn't working on that, and he's responsible for a lot of people dying. So, one other uh, quite similar scenario is rise to power <coughs> of a transhumanist party in a, um, a country, maybe a small country, and mm, this is um, like um, um, our idea. We uh, created, well, we started the process of official registering the Russian Longevity Party in Russia. Um, um, we, because we believe that this idea may be strong if, for example, um, a party comes, comes to, to power in a country, like Norway, for example, with five million people total duration. So we, the transhumanists, could um, perhaps focus our efforts on um, leading Norway to a transhumanist bright future. We could pack our things and just go there and uh, fight for political power in Norway, and then in, if we are victorious, then the neighboring countries would perhaps look um, and say, oh, hey, Norway is doing great things, let's, let's follow the example. And if, um, for example, a country is in the European Union, it could influence the policy of the European Union. And um, if the country is the United States, for example, so if uh, some of you guys unite and create a party and make it successful and then we, then there's the victory. <laughs> that would be the ideal scenario. Um, and I encourage you all to think about that. <laughs> so, but there also are problems with that and the problems are with ourselves because unfortunately it happens um, often that transhumanism Transhumanists are marginal and poor people because really if we want to go to Norway, we have to have the money to buy the ticket to Oslo, right? But the problem could be solved even without the social mandate, without any public being involved. These guys, these awesome guys, didn't need any social mandate for creating uh, quantum physics. They kind of, um, 
said, okay, we really need this. Let's do everything ourselves. And they united, and um, they're my heroes. And we could perhaps, if we could find same kind of bright minds that could unite in order to solve the problem of aging, this could be very efficient. And um, however, there a scientist, a modern scientist, um, he's also living in a very you know rest restrained environment. There are certain standards and stereotypes. For example, there is this uh, fear of not getting a grant if the goal of research is life extension. You literally cannot put those things on a grant proposal because your colleagues will laugh at you um, and uh, the, um, like, I don't know, the uh, grant issuing agency would throw your application into a trash. And um, also, unfortunately, with all those grant applications and reports, scientists <coughs> turn from naturalists, from natural philosophers into managers of science. This happens a lot, unfortunately, and this is also not um, letting us live longer. Okay, but what about these guys? Um, the behavior of billionaires is really not understandable because they live a good life, really, like, things are good. So why not <laughs> extend this beautiful life? Why not um, at least think about um, ways how it can be extended? Well, um, they're making baby steps, I think, in that direction, at least some of them. So Bill Gates is here because in his recent dreaded Q&A session, uh, somebody asked him, um, what's your, what are the things that are in your bucket list? And he said, not die. So this is kind of like an indication that he may be open to the idea in some sort, and um, those three guys, they even um, giving money, like the, the Breakthroughs in Life Sciences Prize, and uh, Sergey Brin has given the, the most, um, that's $1 billion, with the Google Ventures for Life Extension and Technology Projects, um, well, commercial projects, and this is one of the limitations, one of the problems, billionaires want to need a commercial Gain, which kind of cannot be happening because you need to have the basic science before you have those commercial results. And this is um, what the billionaires often do not understand. Also, <clears throat> there is a lack of channels of communication. Like, we cannot come to Sergey Brin, for example, and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to give you like 40 lectures on how you can extend your lifespan on biology of aging and whatnot. Because we can just, this, this cannot happen. Uh, we don't know the um, ways in. And um, unfortunately, there are a lot of frauds and swindlers in the anti-aging field who do you know, who, who put, uh, I cannot really explain how they do this, but uh, the second the billionaire thinks about extending his life, there's, you know, this green or blue uh, smoke, and here comes the wizard who has created the uh, means of life extension, and he said, well, you know, he says, you know what, the only thing is needed is like $20 million, and everything is going to be fine, you're going to have the drug, like, you will live forever, or for a long time. And um, I, I, this happens really, I've seen um, several stories when, when this happened in real life, unfortunately. So, Um, another idea how this could be done, um, for example, um, a lot of people could donate money to scientific research uh, projects in um, fighting aging, and uh, another group of, another huge group of researchers or citizen scientists could implement those research projects into real life. However, there is a need of strong leader with real high credibility so that he could be responsible for fundraising. Um, a person, people could trust uh, their money with. Um, another completely different scenario 
okay, maybe we don't need to do anything. Artificial intelligence comes in and solves the problem. However, <laughs> there is um, a risk that intelligence may not be willing to do this once it's created. And also, um, maybe we're increasing <coughs> the level of complexity. Maybe it's the task of creating the, um, you know, the, the true, the general artificial intelligence that is capable of uh, solving the problem of aging, maybe this particular task is even more complicated than solving the problem of aging. Plus, it also needs uh, funding. There's hope that people who do really, really bad things <laughs> would eventually do some good things. But this could be good. However, um, I wouldn't count the, I, I wouldn't estimate the likelihood of this scenario is very high uh, because unfortunately there is the bureaucracy and um, um, you know other, other bad things about those bad people. However, governments could engage in a um, healthy competition as uh, we are starting to see, for example, so the European Union says, Okay, human brain project, $1 billion. Obama says, no, human connectome project, $3 billion. Yay, <laughs> go, go Obama and go European Union. So if we could you know, get more countries involved, like for example, with trying to instigate this competition in labor bioengineering between Russia and the state, but this is another story. Um, so, yeah. Um, there are also um, some limitations that the good governments are really more um, used to competing in ways how they can destroy lots of human lives, but not preserve them. Another way of how transhumanism and life extension ideas could rule the world, for example, uh, the, the set of com companies that are uh, in one way or another uh, working on transhumanist related projects, they can cover the world with a network. And once people see the actual benefits of transhumanism in their everyday life, they will be more um, receptive of the ideas. Um, although there is the same limitation of um, basic research, because you need to have the underlying science first, you have to have the background. Um, transhumanism can be fashionable. Fashion conquers all. It, when it's, you know, when it's trendy, when it's in, everybody would want to live forever or for as long, you know, as they want. Um, but there is um, a need of a strong charismatic leader who would be um, capable of leading the crowd behind him. Okay, one important thing, what about Big Pharma? Like, what are those guys thinking? I think that actually they are the ones who uh, have the possibility of delivering those interventions, whatever the drugs or, I don't know, longevity viruses, whatever that may be. Um, the <coughs> Pharma companies have to understand that geoprotectors are the uh, next generation blockbusters. Um, well, again, there are pluses, there are minus, minuses. Uh, in this case, in order to have the drugs against aging, aging needs to be recognized officially uh, as a, a disease or a syndrome, so the drugs could be created against this disease. And I, um, I, I'm highlighting this idea again because I think it's very important. If um, the World Health Organization accepts aging as a disease, then we'll have more research, we'll have more attention, we'll have this fight for aging as a political agenda. So, <clears throat> and this actually, by the way, is doable because uh, osteoporosis uh, wasn't a disease, it didn't used to be a disease, but then it was officially recognized and, for example, uh, homosexualism used to be recognized as a disease and people were really treated with, a, people were electroshock. Like, when I learned about this, I was like, seriously? It seems kind of uh, 
absolutely um, unbelievable right now, but that's, that's the fact. Okay, another approach, maybe something like really different. Let's try this. You know, um, secrecy and elitism, they attract. We could perhaps attract, you know, get um, a lot of people on board. However, we also need to have leaders um, who are really motivated and sure that they're doing the right thing and um, that's also hard to get. So, uh, let me some, you know, um, the, 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 what, what are the most important things for um, several or at least one of those scenarios to come um, to life. We need um, strong leaders, strong charismatic leader, but also, and most importantly, we need a successful transhumanist meme. And um, the memes can give rise to strong leaders. So I listed some of the memes that either failed or, um, well, hasn't worked already, but maybe will work in the future, we just don't know that. Um, it doesn't matter how many articles we're reading, it doesn't matter how many movies um, have been shot, it doesn't matter how many talks have been given or conferences organized, still there is no result. Unfortunately, the general public does not about does not know about life essential ideas and how good and beneficial this could be for the humanity. So I propose to create an meme factory. Let's try to think what kind of things we can think of that would promote the ideas of transhumanism and life uh, extension you know, around the world. So it could be a test. Um, we could uh, show in an elegant way how many people die every day in New York, for example. Um, uh, it could be a scientific project like, for example, like keeping a mammal head alive for a certain period of time. It could be something different. Personalized science, in my opinion, is absolute transhumanism because it's dealing with a person's problem of his health, his longevity. It's basically throwing all of the existing science onto one particular person. And it doesn't matter if this person is a billionaire and he's very, and he's gonna benefit the first, we all gonna benefit from that once the technology um, gets cheaper. It could be the interventions themselves that could work as effective means, or I don't know, girls activists like, like you may have heard about Pussy Riot, they, that, that was kind of huge. Um, so now let me just, in a couple of words, um, uh, tell you about what what we've been doing. This is we're we're carrying transhumanist flags. Like um, the the green one that I'm carrying is the H plus symbol. It's a political meeting in Moscow in Russia. We had our transhumanist column. It was a lot of fun. Journalists were asking like, what's transhumanist? What are you guys are? What's your ideas? Tell us about that. That was a lot of fun. We also, well, several months, that was in December 2011, and uh, in September, several months before that, we organized our first, actually, in the World Transhumanist Political Meeting, it's um, in uh, Moscow, <coughs> to Prime Square, and before the Bolshoi Theater, and the next year we organized the second, uh, second meeting. Here's the meeting of a... Um, initiative group of Longevity Party. So as I've uh, mentioned before that we have started the process of official registering the party, but since, well, I live in autocracy, Russia really uh, frowns upon creating uh, new political parties. This process is extremely expensive and complicated. However, we will do our best to raise enough money to um, get the party officially registered. But meanwhile, we, uh, what we can do, we can do actions. They can be political, they can be social, and I think action is, an, is a nice way of 
Uh, it could be a nice way, tool of creating those transhumanist memes. This is in Brussels. Uh, we went to uh, the advancing, uh, no, the um, healthy um, uh, aging meeting in Brussels. And after that, we went to the, that's the fir tree, this white weird thing. Um, we had several, you know, posters and um, other ways how we can, how, how we uh, create, created memes. This is uh, an Arctic bioengineer trachea. Um, this is a surgery uh, being performed by Paolo Michelini. He is um, an Italian regenerative medicine surgeon. And uh, we were able to raise $5 million from the Russian government for his research. And uh, this is an operation that is done, that was done in, in Moscow. And so far, three of those have been performed. And we're trying to persuade our government with this kind of grants and this kind of work that regenerative medicine is, you know, is a very important field. Before those, before we organized the first surgery, it wasn't known, like regenerative medicine wasn't really on the, um, you know, agenda. But now Paolo Michelini is like a Russian scientist who goes to take, participates in conferences all, all, all the time and he taught a lot of people. Um, another thing that we uh, did, we organized the second Genetics of Aging and Longevity Conference and we believe this is the best transhumanist conference in the world. Why? Because, well, it's a really, really hardcore genetics of aging. Um, and why? Because 70% of the researchers who achieved results in life extension, they're talking at the conference and the next one is going to be in April 2014 and everybody is welcome to come and um, learn about how aging can be slowed down. And, um, well, I have an idea how we can, you know, perhaps create um, a Stanford meme. I brought some posters with me, so if you guys just want to go and outside after we're done and take a picture, that would be awesome. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.